I'm probably the most disappointed person in the room that I'm here today. Because uh, yeah, it, it should be Kate. And, and being on the conference um, committee, I had a conscious decision this year that I wasn't going to talk. So I free space and we had a great talk from Kate. Uh, I was on holiday in Spain last week when she dropped out and the easiest thing to do was to substitute her with me. Uh, Saved us from having we've got run around all the other potential speakers who <coughs> go back and say, you know, could you do that? So I'm amazed, so hopefully Kay will get to do it a little bit soon. Um, some of you may have come across the no projects hypothesis um, before. Um, no projects are hashtag and as an idea. It's not entirely my own, and Steve Smith, who's not in the room, but is at conference, really to look at the tallest person at conference, that's Steve Smith. Um, himself and a guy called Joshua Arnold and I started using this hashtag, it must be about two years ago now. Um, the interesting thing was the three of us came from different perspectives, and we had different rationales why we thought the idea of projects was flawed. Um, over the two years, particularly last year, I've probably been more associated with no projects than they have. I tried to be Christian and be on projects, but you know what? On Twitter, that takes four characters more, so no projects to stay at. Um, since this is in the Teams track, I've, I've taken some of the usual no project slides out, kind of compressed the no projects um, side of it. Because, you know, to cut the chase, the, the replacement for projects is Teams. It's teams over projects. Teams are more important than projects. Not just in an agile world, in all worlds, but since we're talking agile, in an agile context, think about your teams. Don't think about the projects, think about the teams, and continue from what Dave was saying this morning. Think about optimizing your teams for learning. Teams are a machine that do work. Some of that work may or may not be called projects. The word project, though, is fundamentally misunderstood. In this presentation, I will show you the PMI definition of a project, and I'll show you the PIMS2 definition of a project. And neither of them relate to what you do in your flips, where you go and say, new project, loan project, or many of the other pieces of the software. Last year, I did a no project presentation at a conference, and a developer came up to me afterwards, and he said, um, you know those PIMS2 definitions of projects you put? I said, yeah, you know, the things that are really important to project managers and project managers to get trained in. I said, yeah. I never knew that about a project. And I never knew a project was supposed to have an end date. I never knew a project was supposed to be technically and all the rest of it. We use the word project so liberally. It means different things to different people. And one of the problems we have in our world is we talk about projects, but we're actually talking about different things. To a developer, a project is as likely as not to be a repository in Git or a Visual Studio setup file or something like that. To a project manager versed in Prince 2 and PMI and all the rest of it, it's a really strict definition. We'll come back to that. As I say, cut to the chase, the solution is Teams. So I've, I've beefed up some of the stuff in, on Teams in here since we're in the Teams track. Um, so this is slightly different to the usual no projects uh, version, but the same, same kind of themes. Um, as Mark introduced me, I don't really say much more about myself. I'm, I'm really a writer, but as you might have heard, um, Writing books doesn't pay the mortgage, so I make my living doing training and consulting, or as actually people like to call it coaching because we're allergic to the word consulting. Um, first two business patterns, changing software patterns, the interesting one, given what Dave just said. You know, this is a book I wrote about six years ago, Learning to Become Agile, it says on the cover. It should be, there's a title there, Learning to Be Agile. For me, the state of agile and the state of learning are the same. Being agile is all about learning, and learning is about being agile. And that's an exploration of learning and software development and why agile is a better fit. Business patterns is about how you run your software businesses. And I said I was never going to write another book, but then I wrote Zampan. Well, I tell Zampan originally here. You can come across Lean Pub, you can write books, and you can sell books, and you can keep on writing books and changing them, and they're electronic. I put these to the print on demand service. You can keep on changing your book. Those two books, business patterns and change something, were, were projects. They were done with a formal publisher, and they had a formal deadline, they had a formal work camp, they had a formal contract, and all the rest of it. Changing software development took about six years in terms of wrap end to end. Business patterns took about eight years end to end. Zampan took about a year. The problem is that after finishing it, 
I keep going back and changing to it. That's why the original version has that cover, and more recently it's adding in a flashy cover. When are you done? Those books were projects. This book is, I don't know what, it's a stream of work. Hopefully it's finished now, but I've only managed to finish it by saying the next install will be called Mount <coughs> And um, The problem with projects, and paraphrase Steve Jobs, the problem with projects, I don't mean this in a small way, it, they're flawed. Um, project models assume you know what you want. You know, um, I have another presentation, and Dave kind of hints at this, which I say, build it right, then build the right thing. If you think about what Dave was just saying, you don't actually know what you really want to build. When you build yourself a machine for building things, when you build a performing team, you can start to build things, you can start to experiment. What does the customer, we have an inkling the customer wants 140 character messaging service, but yeah, yeah. You could write a great big document, you could set up an entire project, all the rest of it. Or you could build yourself a machine for doing little experiments. Um, build it right, then build the right thing. The project model assumes you know what you want beforehand. And you can know what you want for lunch. Yeah, how do you know what you want in a project? Um, it also believes that the, the value is knowable. What is valuable is knowable. And that is one heck of an assumption. Because in the ever-changing world where competitors are appearing and disappearing and technology is increasing so fast, do you know where the value is? Finally, the project model doesn't put value on flexibility and change. The project model is about delivering what you said you were going to deliver in the time you said you were going to deliver it for the amount of money you said you were going to deliver it. So, um, these assumptions do not hold true in the software. You can use the project model if you're doing other things. We can talk about building bridges, we can talk about building aircraft carriers and all the rest of it. Yeah, you, you can shoot me down for that, but I build software, and most of you build software. And most of you are going to find, if you're in the world of publishing, or you're in the world of marketing, or you're in a lot of other domains, that your world's going to look a lot more like software in the next 10 years than it does now. Because as we digitise things, everything starts to look like the software industry. The software industry is the prototype of future industries. The software industry is a knowledge-based digital industry, and all other industries are converging on that. And if you don't believe that, you've not met a 3D printer. One of the problems with projects is they lead to conflict. I've already suggested we don't agree what a project is. We also have a thing that psychologists call goal displacement, and you may have seen this on a project, that the aims of the project, the overall goal the project is trying to satisfy gets forgotten about instead. What can you say about the date? Not the benefit. What can you say about the time? Not the benefit. What can you say about the cost? Not the benefit. What can you say about the features we're delivering? Not the benefit. Time, cost, features. Show me the money. <laughs> Where's the money? Projects are supposed to deliver business value, business money. And some of you work in the government where you're not about making money, but you're about making people's lives better. You're about drilling more wells in sub-Saharan Africa or getting people off drugs or something. There's a benefit here, even if you don't attach monetary stuff to it. And date, time, cost and features are not it. Projects lead to goal displacement. Remember the old definition of a successful project on time, on budget, on all the rest of it? Where's the money? <laughs> Show me the money. <coughs> Project lead to goal displacement. Another problem they have is end dates. Look, I've got nothing against deadlines. I am all for deadlines. You all got to this conference on time, didn't you? Did any of you think about, well, how long will it take me to get to the railway station? How long will it take me to get onto the train? And did you add all them together and say, well, I'll get to the conference on Friday morning. I'll ask the conference if they can wait 24 hours and start 24 hours later. Any of you do that? Yeah. Now what you all did is you saw the conference deadline was, you had to be here for 9 o'clock for Dave Farley's lecture. Yeah? Actually I've just spoken to somebody who's just arrived a little bit late, but he took the decision that he'd seen Dave speak before, and he was prepared to forego an <coughs> hour of conference, the value he would get from hearing Dave's talk, in order to have an extra hour in bed before he drove down this morning. He, he could make that trade off. We are very good at making deadlines. I'm not against deadlines. What I have, I think, against is end dates. Because end dates lead to all sorts of corner cutting, particularly where quality is concerned. We ship with known books. We ship with missing documents. We ship with uh, technical debt and all the rest of it. Now, there's a reason why you may ship with all these things. 
But when you're constantly chasing the project model and project deadlines, which are, you know, end dates where it's all supposed to finish and be done, we end up cutting corners. Successful software doesn't stop. Successful software is always going on. An end date, what we call an end date in a project, is just a point in time. Nothing about projects is they're never big. And the project model is inherently big. Because the project's got to be big, hasn't it? If you start setting up a project to do a bug fix, I know a lot of people who do that. Use the machinery of the project model. Use your organization's project management process to set up a project to do three or four bug fixes. And believe me, there are companies that do that. You've got all the overhead of that administration to do a tiny amount of work. So projects, if you see projects, you usually need to have be signed off by senior people who don't get out of bed for small amounts of money. They write big checks for big things and big time. You've got to do it big. You've got to add stuff in. You've got to make a lot of promises. And any of you follow US politics? You know, pork barrel politics. Thank God we don't suffer from it too much in, in this country, though we get a little bit of it. You know, in America, if there's, if there's a bill going through Congress, you've got to get the votes. And how do you get votes in America? You get the senator from Ohio to, to agree to support the bill, even if he doesn't feel like it. And the senator from Ohio will support the bill if, if there's some money for pig farmers in Ohio in there. So you have a bill to build a new aircraft carrier. And tacked on at the, at the end, there's all these riders, the Americans call them pork. That there'll be $10 million to subsidize Ohio pork farmers. There'll be $50 million for a bridge in Arkansas or something. And you, yeah, the bill has nothing to do with this stuff, but all these things are put on. And projects are like that. Projects end up making all sorts of promises to all sorts of people which are buy the sign, to make them bigger, to get them signed off by the people and get the money and so on. Projects are big inherently. And that's a problem. Because in our <coughs> industry, you know, particularly the continuous delivery world, we're much better off at small. Big doesn't work. We need small. Um, projects result in big batch sizes of work. The project model is optimized for big. The project model is optimized by large pieces of work you want to do, which will take an extended amount of time, and then will be finished. Using a small piece of work is inefficient. So projects are big, they agreed by big, and they have to be, you know, important men in the top organizations, isn't it? There's not enough, um, not enough fairness. The big checkbook, and that imposes a top-down authority, because only the people at the top can sign off big things. So inherently, you're taking power away from the people at the bottom. You know that stuff about agile self-organizing teams and empowerment? If suddenly you've got to push up to get authority. Um, <coughs> what I'm just hinting at is, and, and it, yeah, this is perhaps the most important thing you can ever learn in software development. We don't have economies of scale. We have this economies of scale. Think of it like this. If you walk down the road to Asda, Walmart, you will find, buy yourself a large carton of milk, sorry, these are US pictures, four pints of milk will be cheaper than if you buy four one-pint cartons of milk. This is what you assume, like, like Dave and his optical illusion, you assume that four one-pints will be cheap, will be more expensive than one large carton. Somewhere along the line, even in primary school, You've assimilated this idea of economies of scale. We hear it all the time. It's the rationale for companies merging. It's the rationale um, for gov governments doing centralized procurement and God knows what else. There are industries that have economies of scale. There are industries, like as to selling milk, where buying large quantities of milk is cheaper per unit than buying individual units. Economies of scale are true for milk. You're best off buying your milk in large cartons. On the other hand, software development is cheapest <coughs> in small cartons. If you were buying software milk, you'd be better off buying a carton of milk today, a carton of milk tomorrow, <coughs> a carton of milk the day after, and a carton of milk in the day after. There's all sorts of Reasons about requirements change, which also support that. You may not want a carton tomorrow, but forget about that. Surely, developing four little things <coughs> will be cheaper than developing one great big thing. You see this all the time in software development. We talk about smaller teams being more productive than large teams. We talk about you know stuff Dave talked about continuous delivery. Lots of small deliveries rather than one big delivery. 
you know, small check-ins for developers rather than large check-ins, small tests rather than large tests, again and again and again, you see dis economies of scale in the software industry. The other thing is, this reduces risk. You know, I buy my four, car, four pint cars in the mills, and if I don't drink it by an expiry date, you know, some of it at the bottom is not going to get drunk because it will be off. If I just buy the milk in little packets, as I need it, I will reduce the risk. Think about it like this for projects. Projects tend to be big because they're important things by important people. So suppose we have a project, say it's worth a million pounds, and we judge that it has a 30% risk. Therefore, you know, risk weighted value, 300,000. Split that into two <coughs> small projects, each of which delivers half the value with half the risk. <coughs> each one of these only puts 75,000 at risk. A total of 150,000, as opposed to 300,000. If you instead split into five equal size pieces, you spread the benefit over five deliveries, each one of which is worth a fifth of the original, each one of which has a fifth of the original risk, but the total risk is now, what is that, 60, I can't remember how I did this, 60,000, isn't it? We've reduced it. But if you're optimised for doing this, it's going to be very difficult for doing this. Half the reason why this risk reduced is that each time you do something, you're doing what David Frederick's experiments. You're getting an option to evaluate where you've got to. Do we want to keep doing this? Do we want to do some more? Is it going well? Should we get rid of this? Blah, blah, blah. Simply splitting it down into multiple pieces of work, multiple deliveries, reduces your risk. That's why we don't want big, we don't want big projects. The other thing, and again I just hinted at this, is software isn't temporary. Software hangs around for far, far longer than you ever think it is. Software developers in the room, you ever produced a prototype. Mm -hmm. Now you noticed that the prototype was in use days, weeks, months, <coughs> years after you were told it would be out of production. Yeah? Yeah. Look at the software in the banks. You see HSBC had an outage last week because they're still running those old, old COBOL systems. They'd be 20, 30, 40 years old. Software is our infrastructure today. In the same way that the bridge over the, the Tamar, which many of you crossed over on the way down here on the train, was built by Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Do you think when Isambard Kingdom Brunel was building it, you thought it was going to last 100 or 200 years? That we'd still be using it now? Yeah. Software is our infrastructure the same way bridges and roads and so on are infrastructure. Um, projects are inherently temporary. And I can prove this very simply. Here's the Project Management Institute of America's definition of a project. PMI defines a project by two characteristics. It is temporary. <laughs> right. Prince 2, the UK's answer to PMI. <coughs> a temporary organisation, blah, 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 blah. The project model <coughs> is inherently about temporary things, temporary structures, temporary organisations. This might not be important if we created software and after we had finished it, we could dissolve the organization <coughs> and carry on. But there's another characteristic of software, which means that's problematic. Software keeps changing. Software doesn't stop. You might get a period of that change, but if people use software, it will need changing. You know, what have I got on this? I've got, I've got uh, Mavericks, I think they call it, the Apple Mavericks operating system on here which has evolved, and I'm running PowerPoint on here, it was created life on Windows, the operating systems under them keep changing. The operating systems keep changing because the CPUs inside of them keep doubling in power every year and a half or two years. If software is used, people will want it to be changed. Okay, some of you still have VB6 systems out there and you're demanding your customers install Windows XP. That's kind of problematic. You've frozen that kind of stuff and you're creating all sorts of problems because of it. If software is used, people will want changes to it. Only dead software stops changing. You kill it. Can you imagine if tomorrow morning, or this morning, later this morning in Seattle, the program product project manager, whatever his title is, for Microsoft Office, 
goes into the CEO's office and says, the good news is, after 20 years, we've finally finished Microsoft Office. Office 365 is the final delivery. We can dissolve the temporary organization that created Microsoft Office. <laughs> I know there's plenty of you here who would love Office to stop changing. My own <coughs> wife has repeatedly asked me to go back to a version without the ribbon. Do you know when the ribbon came in? Over 10 years ago? Yeah? Many would love Office, but for Microsoft, what stopped happen? What happened if Office stopped changing? They go bust. Office and Windows are their twin cash cows. They can't bankroll phone, they can't bankroll Bing, they can't bankroll Xbox and the rest of it unless Office and Windows keeps on changing. That means people need to keep buying them. And the same is true about most of the businesses you're in. You're, maybe you're producing software that people take on the CD, you're producing software people use as a service, or increasingly, your company doesn't think of itself as a software company. But underneath it, you're enabled by software. If software stopped doing its stuff, you couldn't do your business. Those examples Dave was given on screen, you know, the, the um, not, not wasn't just NASA, there was the financial ones up there. You see, um, New York Bank Mellon had problems last week because their software malfunctioned. You know, if if there are people like that lose their software capabilities, they're dead in the water. Only dead software has an end date. And I can prove this again. Um, projects end, software does um, First time I did this talk a couple of years ago for uh, British Computer Society Project Management Special Interest Group. They love this talk, by the way. Um, I, I did some research on this. I went, I went to um, um, SourceForge, you know, where we store open source projects. And I looked at um, three, I did a search, I looked at three projects. Moodle, some of you here at the university will know about Moodle, learning management system, very popular. Uh, back in January last year, it was very popular. The week we find it, it's like 23,000 downloads. If that was a commercial product, you'd be really quite happy about it. And it had just been updated three days beforehand. <coughs> Moodle had a lot of downloads and a lot of changes. The changes kept on coming. People were using it. WebTorrent, whatever that is, by the way, had that <laughs> had not had any downloads in the week before I did this query. And I've subsequently repeated some of these queries, and sometimes it's difficult to find WebTorrent. It is downloaded so little, source for you even thinks twice about telling you it's there. Um, <coughs> and it had last been updated nine months before I did the search. It didn't change, nobody was using it. And it's far from unique. Perl, or whatever that is, had also had zero downloads, and it hadn't been changed for 11 months. If they use it, they will want changes. By saying you can't change the software, you're potentially denying benefit to people. Um, successful software, if they use it, it will change. Only dead software keeps changing. The project model is inherently flawed because it is temporary. It's for temporary organizations. I think it's the most destructive idea we have in software. So we go through, we create our temporary organization. You all can see this. I'm mean, storming normally forming, but if we get to the rest of the, 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 the track, the team's track, without this being trotted out half a dozen times, I'll be amazed. This is how you do a team, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a step missing. This is what we think. <laughs> You're a temporary organization. You'll be brought into being. We'll do all this learning. We'll spend all the money for storming normally forming, and then at the end, we'll destroy the team. You see this in the city with the banks. They scan a few developers internally, they go down the labour exchange and pick the first three or four contractors off the row. You've seen that in the city of London, the contractors line up like dockers at the gates in the morning. You, know, you can go to that bank. The project finishes, they're all sent to whatever halls they call the house. And we just look. Why? This bit takes time and money, uh, and then we destroy a performing team. Is this what happens at Manchester United or Chelsea? <laughs> well, 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 good work, I've won some trophies, blah, 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 but you know, we haven't got any games in June and August, so we're not going to pay you. You can save a few million by not paying Rooney over June and July, can't you? <laughs> yeah, we'll just, we'll, you, you guys should, we'll, we'll decide who we'll have in, in the summer, yeah. It doesn't work, it doesn't work, does it? Um, yeah, tell the organisation, it's the most destructive idea. We go through all this stuff with teams, we build them up, and then the project model says, we destroy you. Some of you, by the way, are probably thinking, and I have more points this afternoon. You know what? You know what? I 
And no one's supposed to be destroyed as a team, but we never do actually get destroyed. The organisation keeps saying there's an end date for this project, but at the end of this project, they've invented another project that picks up the same team and does work on the same code base. It's another example of confused project thinking. I know an organisation, uh, every project finishes on the 31st of March. They're very good at finishing all their projects on the 31st of March. Uh, they never lay anyone off. Most of the people are employed on a whole set of new <coughs> projects that begin on the 1st of April every year. Mm. Curious <laughs> those dates, aren't they? Uh, yeah, their financial year and their project model have been brought into sync. Another example of how the project model is. Um, so, yeah, I call this corporate psychopathy. You take a performing <coughs> team and you destroy it, you scatter it to the winds. Uh, and the answer to this is very simple. Stop! <laughs> Don't do it. Stop deluding yourself. Your team has knowledge. Your team has performance record. Your team has capability. Why would you disband them? Project management and software development, yeah. it's a love affair, a match made in hell. The two models are fundamentally in um, So, what are you going to do about it? Um, you organise to do lots of small things. You organise small batch sizes, lots of tiny changes, lots of tiny delivery. You organise around that which is stable, and you plan for continuity. Continuous flow, continuous improvement, continuous delivery, continuous benefit. This is what you want, this is what you're going to aim for. Let me just point out, continuous is not temporary. The project model is about temporary. We are aiming at so, your model, I'll let the focus be taken. Your model from here on is this. Uh, I call it Waterfall 2.0. <laughs> uh, it just keeps on coming. <coughs> flow, flow, flow. Have you ever tried stopping a waterfall, by the way? They're yeah, like stopping it in mid flow It's surprisingly difficult. Uh, they do actually, do you notice they turn Niagara off at night? Uh, Niagara is one great big HGP scheme. And they don't need so much power in the evening, but the tourists and electricity is needed during the day, so they can actually cut off a lot of Niagara Falls and flow in the evening. That's the exception, and they spend an awful lot of money to be able to do that. <laughs> Most waterfalls are like this. They aren't those gradual, and you bring down, bring down, bring down, yeah. <laughs> they go, boom. And certainly that's what I think of as a waterfall. I said, well, shit. So we have our requirements, they start off here with molecules, mo molecules, they flow along, they form out, they come down here, they get to the and they come out. Continuous flow. Work in the small, get good at doing small things, lots of small things. Go fast, seek out the value, repeat, don't stop. And base your work around stable teams. Your team is the same. Now I'm not saying teams never change. Of course, sometimes you get to hire somebody new. Of course, sometimes people decide to move on in their careers. Sometimes people even retire. There are changes to teams, but there's not mass changes. There's not big changes. You don't get rid of an entire team and replace with another one. You don't suddenly double them in size. You don't do things like that. It's gradual changes. It's more organic. You base your work around stable teams. In fact, it cares to me. You recognise this Agile Manifesto, but the Agile Manifesto misses something. So I, I'd like to just, just in here, can I just insert um, teams over projects? Mm -hmm. we, we have learned better ways of developing software, that there is more value to <coughs> teams than projects. Base your work around teams, not projects. Keep the teams together, <coughs> flow the work to the team. Rather than having this project and assemble a team around it, you have a team and you direct work <coughs> to the team. <coughs> Teams work in the small, they work continually, they demonstrate they're delivering value, the team can work to <coughs> optimise itself, to improve itself. I think about a sausage machine. Um, <coughs> we've got our analysts down here, BA, product manager, whatever, they're, they're looking at all the possibilities, all this messy world out there and they're forming neat balls of user stories pass on to our, our programmer here who, who will turn the requirements into something that's a bit more useful and we've got a guy here to test the results coming out <coughs> the other end that the sausages that are delivered meet the criteria we want of the sausages and you just keep on going yeah they get stuff ready they produce it they check it's right yeah that's our model 
you flow the work to the team. Yeah? Yeah? And the other great thing about this is it can create different kinds of sausages. So if you want beef sausages, you put in beef meat. You turn the handle, out come your beef sausages. You want chicken sausages, you put in chicken meat at this end, you turn the handle, chicken sausages come out here. Um, you, you put in, you, um, you want beef sausages, you put in horse meat at this end, you turn the handle, you get beef sausages out the other end. Yeah? There's <coughs> um, your team. The team is working. The team are a stream of development. <coughs> Support requests come in, random requests come in, requests to do estimates come in. Maybe a thing you call a project comes in. Maybe another thing called a project comes on later on. Maybe the team are expected to work on all of this at one time. One of the um, one thing I've never quite got my head around with Scrum is that Scrum says you ring fence the team. There's this team, and they aren't distracted by all the other stuff in the world. You can somehow cut them off from what else is happening in the business and the, the work the guys did previously and the past projects and all the rest of it. You might be able to do that. If you do, please introduce yourself later on, because I've never met a team who can sort of say, oh, the guys who are now on this team will not be interrupted by some random support requests, or the guys who are now working on the product that these guys used to work on aren't going to come out some questions. Or the CEO's not going to call down and say, actually, I want it red instead. You know? Every team, every individual has some baggage, and you can't get rid of that. <coughs> so the idea you can suddenly bring friends to the team and say, no, we don't have to do anything that's not in the team, in the requirements document or on our user story or whatever. It doesn't hold sense in my world. The team are there, the team makes sausages. You put in chicken meat, you get chicken sausage. You put in beef meat, you hopefully get beef burgers out, you beef sausages out your then, you put in, but you know, you, what you put in and what you get out are the same thing. Keep them close to the business. Manage the capacity. You, you've got this pipeline, you've got this sausage community, and there's so many sausages you can make. The decision is not do you make twice as many sausages today as you did yesterday? Do you turn that handle that much faster? The question is do you make pork or do you make chicken sausages today? Or do you make one pork and one chicken? You've got the capacity, you've got the capacity you've got, you just have to decide how you're using it. Which is why you need close business involvement with the business or business representatives know where the value is. Requirements go in, software comes out. There's your team, your coaches, your testers, whatever. They're running the little iterations, we feed the stuff in, product managers, business that, all the rest of it. Working software comes out. Within this model, testers are first class citizens. If you've got testers, a lot of organisations don't. The product managers and business analysts are members of the team as well. I like to talk about a minimally viable team, MVT. You may have a minimally viable product. <coughs> I do not believe you'll ever get a minimally viable product if you have anything bigger than a minimally viable team. And the reason is something called Conway's Law. Every organization will produce systems, in our case software systems, which are a copy of the organization which produces it. So you see um, communication hierarchies in, in your code. You see, you see three layer hierarchies in your code. You've got a database down here, because you've got a database administrator on the team, so there must be a database whether you need one or not. You've got some Java programmers, so there must be a business logic here. And there's got to be a front end here. You, you start with some JavaScript developer. You think there's got to be a front end. So put some JavaScript developer. So JavaScript developers keep themselves busy with a nice big front end here. And then, oh, yeah. People decide what they are going to do on a team, not by looking at their roles and responsibilities every day. People define themselves by the job they do, and the way they define themselves tells them what job they will do today. And if they see themselves as a database administrator, they're going to make sure your product has a database. So you start with a minimally viable team. And I think a minimally viable team may well just be two. I'm prepared to concede two might be slightly more than you, might be slightly less than minimally viable, but start with two. One person is more focused on what the business wants, the requirements, the value, call it what you want. One person is more focused on the technology. Probably to start off with, there's going to be plenty of crossover between them. Let them produce something. Let them see if it works. Let them see if they can, they can form the nucleus of a successful team. If you need to have a third person here, fine, with more team work. But see if your initial people can produce something useful. Do they have the capability? Can they actually produce something? 
And can they produce something that starts to look valuable? You start with two because you're avoiding Conway's law. If you put more than two or three into a team, the team are going to find work to do. Many years ago, I worked at Boitis on a project. They thought it was big. They staffed up with me and somebody else, and some other, there's a project manager, and some other people are thinking in the pie. When you boiled it down to the project, it was actually rather, rather simple. I could, I could satisfy it quite easily. But instead, we produced a whole framework. Instead of being one executable COM object, there was half a dozen. We made it much bigger than it needed to be because we had the resources to make it bigger. So if you start small, see what's a minimal thing you can do, the minimal product, get the feedback, experiment. If the experiment is being successful, then continue the experiment. Maybe grow the experiment. Maybe grow a lot, maybe grow a little. If it's not successful, <coughs> then you Think of your teams as amoebas. I started talking about um, teams as amoebas and amoeba management, and then I discovered that there's a, there's a wonderful book called Amoeba Management. It came out of Kyosha in Japan, and they actually have the idea of amoeba teams and amoeba management down by hat. Um, it's, it's an interesting book to read, but the key for them is associating each team's output with value. They've changed their entire accounting system to make sure each team, each amoeba, can be in contact with the value they are producing. They know who their customers are. So you start with a small team, maybe, maybe one BA, a couple of programmers, or one of each or something. Yeah. And they <coughs> produce something accessible. You grow the team. You grow the team. And at some point, you split the team. And then you can grow those teams. And you don't need to do an even spread, split. You, you could have you could have three people going down this team to form a new mini revival team, and you can have seven people go over here to form another team. Uh, this is one reason why I'm not, I'm not really enamoured by this magic number seven for teams. Seven plus or minus two, you probably come across that, you all the scrum, but it doesn't actually stand up very much when, when you look at it. Smaller maybe, larger maybe, um, actually comes originally from a paper by, uh, by Miller in the late 50s, and you can find any research for it either. Seven may be a good number for your team, because what scrum does it say is who is on the team, scrum regards everyone as team members. But, you know, it's going to be a mix of product owners, product managers, testers, blah, blah, blah. And I, I would start with a team of, say, three, and then start doing something, and then producing something useful, four, five, six. I'd let the team grow up to 10, 11, 12. Somewhere above 10, you're going to start thinking about splitting the team. Now, when you split the team, you need to think carefully about how you can split each team so they can have their own meaningful entity. You don't want to have a platform team and a user interface team who have to constantly be negotiating. You want to find entities they can both carry on with themselves. And interestingly, a lot of the technical practices and continuous delivery, test driven development, blah, 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 that can help teams work independently even if they're working on the same product, the same code base. So getting your technical standards higher allows teams to be more independent. And as we code, you want to decouple these teams. You want lots of individual teams who aren't dependent on each other, each producing good stuff. And you use the technical practices to allow the teams to be decoupled. Your focus is always on the team. And in an ideal world, one team, one product, services, one business domain, one business field, something like that. Um, as I say, that's ideal. More likely than not, the team are going to get some crud thrown from other projects, from past experiences, from random places. Um, maybe one team has to actually service two products. That, that's okay, that's fine. As long as the team has a way of prioritizing between the two products, as long as there's somebody on the team who has the authority to say, they're going to get stuff this week and they're not, someone who can say, no. That's okay. Teams can service multiple products. You may need larger teams to service you know, more and more. At some point, you'd split them. But when you're in the opposite mode, when teams are contracting, when products are retiring, products are getting older, you may actually go reverse and merge teams back together. Um, it contains all the skills. Uh, if you've not heard it already, you know, it's the idea of vertical teams. The team is responsible for the entire delivery. The team contains all the skills you need there. Um, I have on occasion come across organisations which use a horizontal model. This model seems to be more prevalent in companies that believe they, uh, they do something akin to the waterfall. Um, you have a whole bunch of different people, and they, they interact. You know, Swing starts a business analyst, 
It goes down to business logic. People who ask me are the database people, who ask me are the user interface people, who pass me over the test. Um, you know, you've got these teams, who are all, these teams are independent, but they only do their functional area. Therefore, getting a piece of work done means you've got to coordinate all these different teams. You've got to get a business analyst to do some work, and then you've got to get a business logic to do some work in the database. It all makes it work for a manager to manage. It's all about team coordination, because these teams don't actually deliver anything for themselves. They all produce a little bit of the pie, which when put together will produce a winning entry in the great bake-off. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You want to mix them up. The teams are vertical. Analysts, UI, business logic, each team is capable of producing a little something. Um, each team can take responsibility for that. And each team, <coughs> when somebody drops out that end, they can go and see what value they've delivered. Something we've not touched on yet, going back to what I said with the project model. The project model forgets about value and benefit because it's chasing these other goals. All we need to say is, we may think when we inject something at the top that this is going to make us a million dollars. But when it comes out the other end, does it make us a million dollars? You might notice if it makes you ten million dollars. But if it just makes you a million dollars, is that a success? Is that a failure? If it only makes you half a million dollars, what does that imply? If it makes you ten thousand dollars, what does that imply? What you've also got to do is you've got to do more analysis at the end. You know, um, we see teams these days do user testing. They push stuff out and it's in Dave's three feedback models. You know, user testing at the end. Is the thing we have delivered delivering the value that we thought it was when it went in the front end? Now, it's very easy for teams who produce customer basing products to give those products on the web and there's millions of customers out there to talk about user testing and lean, lean uh, product models where you push something out and see if somebody uses it. If you're in a corporate IT environment, that's often far, far more difficult to do. Because you know, there may be one guy who needs to use it, and what value do they get from it? There still needs to be some evaluation process here at the end that says, are the things we're putting in, are they delivering any value, let alone the value we expected them to? In the same way, the software teams can calibrate their own performance by looking at their, their Kanban boards, their lead times, their working production, their story points, whatever, and they can calibrate upcoming work against their past performance. We need to calibrate the expected value going in against the expected value coming out. Now, I'm sure many of you know people in your organisation who make a big noise about getting the thing they want. But that thing is invariably of little value to anybody, let alone themselves. But they feel that they've got to have this thing. If you're not looking at what comes out here and measuring value, how can you say to Fred, you know what, Fred, we've done five things for you this year, and none of them have produced anywhere near the value you asked for. Therefore, why should we do your sixth thing? Why should we do Jim's first thing? You need to look at the value. You need to have a feedback loop here. What's the value? What's the benefit coming out here? And this needs to be part embedded within this team. It points out to an analyst role again. The other thing is, and, and this, if you're in an organisation that is clinging to projects, this is especially true, you want to favour short and fast over long and thin. Rather than have three developers each work for three months to produce three things, have your three developers work for one month and produce something, another month produce something else, another month produce something I know three women do not have a baby in three months. There's a limit to how much substitutability can go on here. But on a lot of teams, you will find individual solo developers. In fact, I've seen one piece of research that says, in America, over 50% of projects, whatever that might be, are single developer projects. I'm sure many of you work on single developer projects. Get away from single developer projects, because a single developer does not a team make. One person is not a team, no matter what, how, how some people misuse those words. The thing about it, if you're working short and fat rather than long and thin, you get benefit delivered much more quickly. You get benefit delivered much more quickly, because something, anything is coming out the door and you're getting the benefit in whatever form of that. You're, you actually boost your return on investment, NPV, however you want to measure it, massively, because you bring forward the point at which 
benefit is delivered. If you do nothing else but bring forward some of the <coughs> deliveries, your, your, your return on investment rockets. Get away from having long, thin, solo or small projects and try and get further. So this is an occasion, I give you, where economies of scale make sense. Larger teams delivering something faster rather than long, thin ones. There are occasions where economies of scale make sense, and even in our industry, just before you assume economies of scale, think about it, examine it, perhaps do an experiment. I think I'm almost exactly on time. You are. I have no, I have no time for people who push agile and don't finish on the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> people sometimes say to me, oh, we can't do agile in this project because we've got a hard deadline. That's where agile is ideal. Project with a hard deadline is the easiest to manage. That's what agile is all about. Thank you. We've got a few minutes for, uh, for, for questions. Alan, thanks very much. So when you eventually you get into team selection, select your people for their ability to learn, their ability to master other languages, the stuff like that. Um, there's, there's a book, um, I, it's a very enjoyable read, so I recommend it highly. A book by a guy called Richard Sheridan, who runs a, a software company over in uh, Michigan. And he, he took, basically the whole company does extreme programming. But he talks a lot about how his team is just select the language they're going to use. And if they need to, they learn the language. And his developers find it odd when people start talking about the, the depths of the language. And I define them as, I'm a C-sharp developer. Um, get developers who can switch between them. If your developers can't, then use the language they know. You know, all the languages we have <coughs> these days can tackle just about all the problems we have. Faced with setting up a new team of Python developers to produce something we want to produce in Python, and asking a C-sharp team to produce the same thing in C-sharp, and go for taking the existing team who have a track performance. Yeah? So, optimise the learning, don't be scared to change, recruit people who can learn, be able to change the technologies. As, a, as an XC++ developer, as a recovering XC++ developer, <laughs> maybe I, say, um, I think one of the reasons why C++ doesn't have as much of a future as it once had it's just, if you want to be a good C++ developer, you need to dedicate your life to C++. You, you, that, that, there isn't much, there isn't enough time in the world or space in your brain to know much else than C++. I think one of the things we are seeing with languages is we, we're seeing fewer of these in-depth languages. The problem is, every language eventually becomes C++. Delivering is more broader than often, uh, uh, clash against the big companies' perception of their brand being prestigious, and so the product needs to be large, and polished, and take on time. Exactly. How do you counteract this argument? They'll go out of business eventually. <laughs> uh, you know, if it wasn't the fact that the government standing behind, do you think HSBC and RBS and all the rest could stand for all the IT outages they've been having recently? They've become so great. These companies are failing. Um, and the question you have to ask yourself is if the big companies keep on doing this, what will their competitors do? You, as a small company, can take on those big companies because those big companies can't do this stuff. These big companies are so wedded to big projects that they cannot take advantage of a lot of the stuff that's coming along in technology. The other thing is they waste shed loads of money. Go back two years. Do you remember the BBC cancelled the digital production project? They cancelled it after they spent 50 million pounds. Thank God the BBC had 50 million pounds to fund a failed project. Isn't that great? Uh, yeah, we know about that because the BBC is quasi-public sector. So, but you know, big corporations waste this kind of money all the time on software projects. Fortunately, US consumers of their products don't have much choice but to fund their IT. 
And if you are small company, there's opportunities there to find ins there. Either displacing the big companies with their <coughs> customers, or by producing something really innovative, because big companies can't produce because they can't do it. The, the, the other thing to bear in mind is when you get into the big project model, like BBC Digital Production Project, that project, 50 million in wasted. Don't we all wish it had been cancelled at 25 million? Why wasn't it cancelled at 25 million? You know, when it was cancelled at 50 million, it was all over the front pages of the newspapers, you know, and the Daily Mail said it must never happen again. You know, if it had been cancelled at 25 million, it probably would have been all over the front pages of the newspapers. If it had been cancelled at 10 million, it would have still been in the newspapers, it would have still been on the front page of the Daily Mail, but maybe it would have been on the front page of, of the Times. If you cancelled at 5 million, it'd still be in the papers. If it cancelled at 1 million, it might get a mention. If it's cancelled at half a million, when you say we're going to have a big project, it becomes a self fulfilling fallacy. And like the waterfall, it's very difficult to stop. If you are one of the managers responsible for the digital production project, and you know you're in, you, you spend 5 million, you have sunk 5 million of BBC money into this project, and you can see it's failing, well, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the director general and say, we should cancel this. No, they didn't do that. They went to the director general and said, can we have a bit more money so we can reset the project, so we can restart it. The more money you've spent on it, the more money you've sunk, the more difficult it is to admit you've got the experiment wrong. So all the days hypothesis talking, yeah, great stuff. If you have bet $10 million on a hypothesis, it's rather embarrassing to say the hypothesis has proved false. It's far better for your career to say, can you give us five million, one more fix, another five million, and we'll make the hypothesis that come on, come on. And five million dollars down the line, <coughs> one more fix, no, five million more, we'll get the hypothesis that works, five million more. Yeah. If you're a big company, you've got serious problems, you can try and adjust it. On the other hand, if you're a small company, that's your opportunity. Okay. We've got time for about one more question, maybe lots a burning question before we finish. So if you're a company and you've got a few of these teams of what, six, seven people, high performing, they're getting things done, do you, would you promote people moving between teams and rotating? Yeah, yeah. Or would you promote yeah. kind of staying the same? No, I, 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 I think they are there, they, they have continuity there, they stay there for a long term, but they will from time to time move for the teams. Even better still, we've got anyone from Unruly in the room. Now, there's a couple of guys here from Unruly, go and see them. What Unruly and some other companies I know in London do is they do programmer exchanges. So the guys from Unruly, from time to time, somebody will go and work at another company for a week. They're still on the Unruly payroll. I mean, they've done all the NDAs and no poaching and all that, but someone from Unruly will go and work at another company, just eat or somewhere for a week. And somebody from that company will come and work at Unruly for a week. You periodically, you go, you do, they do swaps between companies. I mean, not just do, you know, in your case, yeah, do swaps between teams. Go and work on another team for a few weeks and come back to your own team. Maybe you move over there, you know, like, like football teams. You know, periodically, people move teams, the largest successful teams that are held together. Yes, there's changes. You try and limit them, they become the unusual thing rather than get away from this idea of a pool of people. Do some swaps. And open your world up, open up to other ideas by going and seeing what other completely different people do. Cool. Alan, we'd like to give people a chance to move around there. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Alan. <laughs>